everyone. Welcome back to Special Interests with Bob and Donna, Bob Banfelder and Donna Durasmo. We have a very special segment today, and um, Bob is going to show off his culinary skills, which he hasn't done on YouTube before, so you're in for a treat. Uh, but before he gets into what he's going to get into, which I'll introduce in a moment. I just want to let you know who we are. Um, I am a, a retired educator with the New York City Board of Education for 32 years. I can't believe I lasted 32 years, <laughs> but I did with wonderful children. And uh, Bob is an award-winning crime thriller novelist and outdoors writer. He is a member of the Outdoor Writers Association of America, the New York State Outdoor Writers Association, and we are both members of the Trumansburg Fish and Game Club, and Bob is a new member of the Newfield Rod and Gun Club in uh, central New York, a beautiful spot that we get to vacation in once in a while. He is also the recipient of the Lifetime Achievement Award from Who's Who in America for his fiction and nonfiction. His fiction includes nine novels, and his nonfiction includes four handbooks on hunting, fishing, and writing and getting published. So if you're interested, they're all available on Amazon and most of them are available in ebook format for your Kindle. So Bob is going to do a segment on reverse sear Chateaubriand. Sounds very fancy, doesn't it? <laughs> okay, so I'm going to... Um, it is a fancy, fancy, a fancy dish. A fancy dish, fancy dish. But we're getting older, so we decided to go fancy, right? <laughs> fancy and expensive. We have more time. We have more little, time little to go more fancy. Time. Yeah. yeah, instead of uh, quick 30-minute uh, meals, right? Or 15-minute yeah. meals. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to uh, let Bob... Uh, talk to you a little bit. Uh, he's working on a new book and he's going to incorporate what he's doing today into the book. So I'm going to hand it over. Which will help explain and give a little history, a little background for this dish that we'll be making. The reverse the Chateaubriand. You're yes. on. Okay. As Donna said, she really didn't emphasize the point. We usually say very unique show. What you, most of our shows are pretty different. This is going to be a truly, truly unique show because we're going to be incorporating some of my writing here, not to show off my writing, but to give you good background information to understand this dish that we'll be creating. It is a fancy, fancy dish. It can be a complicated dish if you let it, but if you learn to do things in steps, it's really a piece of cake, and it's fun. If you're into cooking, you're really going to enjoy it. If you're no at cook, new at cooking, you're going to be a nervous wreck, but we'll get over <laughs> that. Okay, so I have a tentative title for my new um, thriller book. Uh, it's a tentative title. It will be the, actually Donna mentioned nine novels now. Uh, it'll be the uh, the tenth one. And it'll give you a good idea of the kind of work that I put into my writing and the work that I put into meals. Uh, and not many of them are 15, 20, 30 minutes like this. Most no, of the, well no, I do no. most of the cooking yes, there. Yes, I'm lucky. Yeah, Sometimes I'm the sous chef for... and the cleanup oh, lady. Yeah. But yeah. he does all the cooking, so I'm lucky. Okay, so. So what's the title of the Tentatively book? titled, okay. The Culinary Killer, Chapter One. The man smiled warmly down at Charlotte Endicott before continuing his tutelage. Charlotte sat sullenly silent. He goes on. Therefore, a brown sauce is the most versatile of the famed five-star mother sauces used in cooking, Charlotte. He paused, then laughed loudly before continuing. Do you see the importance of a pause in speaking or a comma in writing, Charlotte? Otherwise, it would have come out. A brown sauce is the most versatile 
of the famed five-star mother sauces used in cooking Charlotte. In other <laughs> words, I'd be speaking about cooking you. The young man nodded and grinned broadly. Yes, your brown sauce is a basic sauce for so many gourmet and derivative dishes. But basic is not what we'll be dealing with here this morning as well as into the wee hours. No, indeed. And when I say will, I mean you and me because we're going to create like artists. Yes, we are going to be elaborating on the fundamental foundation of that most inviting all-around brown sauce, bringing it to its pinnacle, referred to as a spaniel sauce. For a spaniel sauce is the quintessence of the purest form of a true brown sauce. A spaniel, the man repeated. It's the French pronunciation and spelling of the word Spanish. The man slowly spelled out the word. E-S-P-A-G-N-O-L-E. -E. Don't ask me how all this came about exactly. Something about King Louis VIII and his fiancée Anne being influenced by some Spanish cooks who didn't quite find favor with the flavor of the traditional French sauce being prepared for the king and queen's wedding banquet. And so the Spanish cooks added Spanish tomatoes to the recipe to enhance richness and flavor. The ceremonial dinner was a huge success. So out of respect, that country was honored by having the Spanish name, Espanol, adopted as the altered French sauce. Anyhow, a spaniel sauce is comprised of a half brown stock, referred to as mirepoix, combined with an equal amount of brown sauce in order to create an authentic spaniel sauce. But to finish off that decadent savory liquid, we are going to thicken it reducing it by half over a low flame in order to create a port wine-based demi-glace. Demi, demi meaning half, glace meaning icy. See how all these things come together so neatly, Charlotte? The sauce will be the finishing touch to our Chateaubriand. Needless to say, we have a lot of work to do. The key to making life easier is to do as much preparing as possible well ahead of time. We'll make about a quart of a spaniel sauce and I'll freeze the rest in ice cube trays to use when I invite other guests just like you. So let's get busy. Charlotte's set seated in a corner now trembling. Now, the first thing we have to do is to create that mirepoix because it takes the longest to prepare at least eight hours on a low flame or anywhere from 8 to 18 to 24 hours for a superb flavor. A mirepoix is an aromatic vegetable base to enhance the taste of many sauces, soups, and so forth. It's basically a mixture of coarsely cut onions, cel I'm sorry, coarsely cut carrots, celery, and onions. But again, basic is not at all what we'll be dealing with, no indeed. We'll be striving for, per per for perfection and creating the extraordinary like so many innovative gourmet chefs throughout the world. A recipe I immensely enjoy includes the shanks, joints, and knuckles from both veal and beef, along with spices, herbs, and seasoning. Condiments like rosemary, thyme, tarragon, parsley, cloves of garlic, bay leaves, oh, and lots and lots of leek. So, 
What I'd like you to start doing, Charlotte, is to coarsely chop up these carrots, celery, and onions on the table before you. I'll take care of the leeks. And be careful not to cut your fingers with that knife and cleaver because they're very, very sharp. Charlotte cringed. You'll note that I separated the heavily salted, I'm sorry, you'll note that I separated and heavily salted the center cut section from the end of the length of a prime beef tenderloin for our Chateaubriand. The salt will help dry the meat for a reverse searing process we'll be employing rather than the traditional method of initially searing it in a hot pan atop the stove then cooking it in a rather hot oven. No. What we'll be doing is first cooking the meat slowly in the oven set at a very low temperature. Slow and low is the name of the game for several good reasons. Namely, is that the roast will cook evenly from edge to edge throughout without leaving you with that grayish overcooked outer edge. Served either rare or medium, the roast will be the desired cover color overall. A medium rare pink coloring is what I prefer. I used to like my beef served rare. Walk it in, sit it down, and wipe its horns off, I joke around. But quite seriously, Charlotte, utilizing the reverse searing method and having the roast served medium rare, folks are pleasantly surprised to learn that the meat is actually juicier and more flavorful. It truly is. So, I'm going to put this piece of heavily salted center cut beef tenderloin in the refrigerator to sit overnight. That will create a pellicle and aid in producing a nice thin brown crust when we finish off the roast and a cast iron skillet atop the stove, basting it with our drop dead savory sauce. Charlotte began to weep bitterly. Don't cry, dear. You'll be around long enough to enjoy the first course, course and maybe even partake in the main event. Now, I suggest that you start cutting up those vegetables. And remember that knife and cleaver are extremely sharp, what I like to call scary sharp. And I'm going to stand over here away from you in case you get any crazy ideas, the man giggled brushing back his lengthy blonde hair. Poor Charlotte. Poor Charlotte. Poor Charlotte. Oh my. But what we covered here is what we'll be covering in the kitchen. But it won't be as dramatic as with no, Charlotte. Of course not. No, I won't be cringing in the kitchen. <laughs> okay, <laughs> no, so? Folks. So uh, we're going to move into the kitchen and uh, Bob will... Uh, I'll be behind the camera, and Bob will do his thing with the Chateaubriand reverse shear, sear, reverse sear. shear, reverse, reverse sear. sear process. So we'll see you in a bit. Okay, so we're going to uh, start with step one for our mirepoix sauce, and uh, those of you want to. Check that out. That is uh, M I R E P O I X, Mirepoix, which is comprised of onions, carrots, and celery. Well, you see many, several other vegetables here, which we're going to, I'm taking the liberty of adding uh, based on um, some of my experience and some of my research, but uh, basically that's what you start with for the traditional mirepoix before going to step two and combining some of the other vegetables. And let's just go through the other vegetables. 
you'll, uh, you'll see here that we have some parsley that Donna has been growing. Uh, we have a nice bunch of kale here. No, leek. Uh, leek. Thank you, Donna. <laughs> and uh, by the way, when you get your leek, your leek is very, very filthy, very, very dirty. It needs to be washed thoroughly. So don't do this cursorily. Just uh, take your time and do it nicely. Okay, you'll see. Donna, can you home in on this? See how filthy this leak is? Yeah, especially down okay. by the white part. So you would have to, uh, you know... Wash everything. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, while we're on the leak for a moment, when I use um, as the um, antagonist in that novel that we looked at, Chapter 1, was saying you're going to use lots and lots and lots of leak. And when I say lots of leek, I mean the white part, after this is washed thoroughly, as well as the leaves. I cut off the very, very tips, wash thoroughly, and then uh, chop these up. These vegetables are to be chopped coarsely. Okay? And so we talked about the parsley. We have here some garlic we'll be needing. We need some scallions. Scallions. We need some chives. Chives. We need some shallots. shallots. Okay. A lot of onions. Huh? Uh, we'll also need that multicolored peppercorns. Um, all spice puts out one, they call it tricolor, but it's actually mm -hmm. four colors because they don't consider the black peppercorns as a color. Uh, they even make a joke about it, uh, saying, oh, we, we messed up the number, whatever. So, anyways, um, you can see here. Okay, and what I, I have a couple of pepper mills here. You can see, Donna, put your hand out, so maybe, and you can pick this up in here. Just to show them if we can pick up the color. There should be some pink in there. This is a, I have this set at coarse. I probably have this set at coarse, but let's see. Well, you really can't see the, but it is the multi, it is this multicolor mm -hmm. uh, assortment here. Okay, other ingredients that we'll need. We'll need either kosher or sea salt. In other words, we want a coarse salt. We'll need some bay leaves, a couple. We'll need some butter and some very, very, very nice extra virgin olive oil. Okay. We'll also need some wine. Not a top shelf wine for the demi glace that we'll be doing, but later on for drinking and passing around this marvelous Chateau Brion. Save your top shelf wine for that. Don't use top shelf wine for your cooking. This is a nice bottle of Josh wine, one of our favorites. This vintage is 2014. And it is a Cabernet, Cabernet Sauvignon, a very, very nice wine. But again, you can use your favorite wine. Uh, could be Zinfandel, could be Cab, could be Shiraz, your choice. Um, Donna, as a matter of fact, let's have a little laugh over here. Focusing on <laughs> oh, this our here. Our friend made this as a Christmas present. I tried cooking with wine, but after four glasses, I forgot why I was in the kitchen. <laughs> so hold off on driving until you get going, knowing what you're doing. Enjoy a glass. I drink wine while I cook, but certainly limited to no more than a glass, really. Otherwise, that would be that sign would be really apropos. Okay, so. We also need 
a good sieve, a fine mesh sieve. This is not a good fine mesh uh, sieve, but it's all I have. I have uh, the one that I'm after on, on, uh, on order. It is a deep funnel shaped, um, conical shaped uh, fine mesh sieve. And Chinois. Shinwa, or call it. Uh, a China cap, China it's cap. Re mm -hmm. referred to also. So just picture this, that will be uh, conical shape, deep funnel, um, and why? Because, well, when we break down these vegetables and make a, uh, a brown sauce, we'll be pushing the liquid out and then discarding the vegetables. You don't keep those vegetables, you just want that liquid and then that liquid will be reduced by half. So, let's take a look at this. This isn't uh, an absolute necessity, but I'll tell you, when you're dealing with $132.26 beef loin tenderloin that's been peeled we'll talk about doing your own in a moment or two but you don't want to foul this up your first or second time out so what I suggest doing is getting from Costco they have beautiful meats at Costco I suggest getting your prime peeled extreme um, center cut uh, prime loin tenderloin which is filet mignon, but um, what were those three, uh, the two ladies and the fellow that we researched, I mean, famous, famous uh, uh, chefs. Do you remember, Donna? Julia Child. Julia Child. Martha Stewart. Martha Stewart, and, and the was, fellow's was name a, a I forget. French, a French chef. French guy. Mm -hmm. Well, he was talking about making a Chateaubriand from not that center cut of the tenderloin, but from another piece, the butt end, the big rounded end. You'll see when we open up the, um, the meat in a moment, you'll have a very, very long piece, a uh, big piece called uh, the chain. You got your butt end. Uh, you will be cutting off the ends and dealing with the uh, center, with the center cut. And that is your true filet mignon uh, for Chateaubriand, not other sections of this beef. Um, so, let's see. Another important tool, a very important tool, again, because you don't want to foul up, you don't want to foul up a $132 piece of meat which runs $29.99, $30 a pound, the first one that I bought, showing you that tag over there. And you can save, you can save $10 a pound. You can get this beautiful prime meat for, um, instead of $39, you can get a $19, um, saving $10 a pound by taking the silver skin off the meat with a very nice, sharp, flexible fillet knife. You can take that silver skin off if you want to discard that. Then you turn your meat over and you scrape the fat off the back. Not using the blade, you just take the, uh, the fat off. Oh, and back to that silver skin. We won't be doing this because this is peeled already. I may find a spot of silver skin. I doubt that will show you how this operates. You put the knife underneath the skin and then just flip it back so you can grab the tag and then take your knife and lift the blade up so you're not cutting into the meat and you're just cutting that silver skin away and you discard that. Okay, so again, you don't want to foul up this meat. So I suggest 
getting a Primo in the oven thermometer. And we're going to take a look at this guy in a moment. We're going to open this up and see what we have here, the way this is packaged. Okay, here's our unit. Okay, and you can see that you have Fahrenheit for a max and we'll be peeling this off here. This is just to give you an idea, okay? You can see that there's nothing under here, but I'll just leave this here for the moment. Uh, you have a minimum setting. You have your current temperature. You have a low alarm and you have a high alarm and then you have a timer with <clears throat> volu decibel volume. You can set this high low. So you can take this and if you had a stainless steel oven refrigerator this would stick to it or you could simply tilt this and operate it from here. Now, and it comes see. in a lot of colors too, doesn't it? It comes in nine different colors, Donna. And I selected the blue. Figured that it would show up nicer on, uh, you know, YouTube. In this pouch that the unit came in, that the thermometer came in, we have this probe. And the probe goes into your meat and this end gets pushed into here and you have very, very, ac very accurate temperatures, temperature readings without opening up the oven door to keep checking your meat. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is really well worth the money. I think it was like $59 and change or something. And, then on that. Mm -hmm. and it's made by, this is the Chef Alarm. This uh, is the Chef Alarm. By Thermoworks. Thermoworks, written together, Thermoworks. Yes, they're, on, they're online at www.thermoworks.com, T-H-E-R-M-O-W-O-R-K-S, all written together. And now, before I use this, what I had to do was check the oven as I was coming up to different degrees that I was looking for, open the oven, lose the heat, and uh, this saves you that aggravation. Plus, when you are ready to take the Chateaubriand out and put the section that we're going to be using in a cast iron pan atop the stove to sear it, Searing, let's call the log shape four size. You sear all size for about 30 seconds. You sear the ends, and there's like no guesswork involved. Of all the units that I researched, I found that this is, this claims to be, of course, by the company, but by many people, that this is the most accurate or if not the one of the most accurate. The Chef Alarm by Thermoworks. Pro Series Temperature Probes. And I have different probes for different applications, but the one that you see here um, is the one that we'll be using. So, let's see. In addition to some of the vegetables that we've seen here, I keep this frozen it's nice in the summertime. It's not summer now. As a matter of fact, it is January the 12th on a Sunday. And Donna, just as an aside, come on over here a second. Show them the temperature outside. Oh, it is so warm today. 
It is according to our accurate. It's seventy one degrees. If you can see that. Seventy. But of course degrees. the sun is hitting it. But you can walk out in shirt sleeves today. Oh yeah, it's a, which it's is beautiful. Middle of January, yes. isn't that marvelous? Donna, do I have to drop this? Yes, please. Okay. Okay. Otherwise. Okay. So what do we have here? Otherwise, you won't see. So we have tarragon that we'll be using. Rosemary, and when I make this, I'll be using uh, fresh here. But what's left over, you certainly can freeze. So I want to get this back so in you a want freezer to tell the folks so we have how time. We froze that? How we, we washed that? We kept them wet. Oh, you tell them. them. Okay, we wet them. Of course, they were washed. Wet them and put them in little snack bags, and stuff them in our freezer for future use, so we don't waste. And they can go into your soups and whatever you're uh, doctoring up. So, and let's along. put this aside and we'll go into the refrigerator. Ah, two pans that we'll be using. When we uh, brine the meat. I have a small tray here. This will go into the refrigerator. The meat will sit on top of this elevated um, shelf here, if you will, so that air will circulate through. Okay, And then when we're going to be cooking this, we'll use the bigger tray. Uh, but actually, we'll be doing this for Donna and myself initially, so I'll probably use this in the oven. But if I had a group of, say, eight people or so, I would be using this larger tray. So, let's look at this bad boy coming out here. We'll be using several meats, bones, bones from the veal. If you can get, which is hard to get, we've been running around trying to get uh, veal bones. Uh, sh the shank you can get pretty uh, without a problem. Um, the knuckles, uh, the joints from veal and beef. Not and or, but veal and beef. Um, we'll be talking more about that in a moment. And being that I really can't get the veal bones the way I like them, such as the meat that you see. Neck bones, I believe, on the beef bones. Beef neck bones, Beef yes. neck bones, okay really can't get this uh, in the in several markets that we went to so got to go for a few bucks and what I'll do is I'll cut the meat off of here make beautiful veal uh, Cutlets. chops less the bone because I'm going to be using the bone here and here and that's for the mirepoix correct? and that's for the mirepoix yeah, the ah, beef and the one veal. thing I Failed to mention, we'll need one more. Uh, I don't have it here, it's downstairs. A can, a six ounce can of tomato paste that we'll be rubbing on these bones here, if you will. For the mirepoix? Uh, not for the mirepoix, uh, really. Yes, yes, and no. Yes, and no. Let's explain down the pike. Okay, so your mirepoix again, Donna, are those vegetables, those three trio of vegetables that I mentioned, the, um, the celery, the onion, and the carrots. That's your first step. What we'll be doing with the veal and, and the and beef is to uh, go to step two and make this uh, 
brown sauce mm -hmm. combined with the mirepoix. Okay. okay, so we won't be using this right away, so I'm going to put this back in the refrigerator and we're going to open this bad boy. This is a 4.42 pound beef tenderloin prime peeled extreme. And we purchased this, as Bob said, from Costco. We purchased it yesterday on the 11th, and this is very important to note too. Donna, do you know where my other tag is that I had out here? No. Okay, I have it in my head anyways. Um, I wrote this down here. This was purchased uh, on 111 uh, 20. Which was yesterday. Which was yesterday. Mm -hmm. And the one before it, I wish I could find that tag here, but all right, okay, let me kind of wing this. You have about three weeks of shelf life, if you will, that you can keep this in the, re, uh, in the refrigerator. Because um, it's vacuum sealed. It's vacuum sealed, but if I was to open this up, I'm going to mm -hmm. be moving this mm -hmm. along. So what we're going to do, we're going to open this up, and um, where I paid $29.95 for the first one, uh, this was couple bucks up per pound. This was $27.99. And like I said, you can save $10 a pound by taking the silver skin off and the fat that you would find underneath here normally. But again, this is prime, peeled, extreme. You pay for it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's do that. because this is going to come. It's going to be juicy. And it's going to be pouring out. And we'll see how this, the ends are tucked underneath here. Okay, fold it over. This is where those famous chefs, you know, use the butt end here for the Chateau Briona. Yeah, this is your filet mignon in here, your centerpieces. Uh, this is all prime beef, but anyways, what we're going to do Oh, let me go back to that knife again. Let's see if we can Not bad here. There's not really the silver skin, but what you would do would be to cut it to get a tag and then come here and just raise your knife and cut that silver skin off, which we really don't have. We have a, That's uh, just a little, little bit, bit of here. fat. Yeah. I mean, what I'm doing here is not necessary. I'm just trying to show you here uh, what we'll be dealing with. So. Okay. And I think I'm going to keep this as a hole here. And on the other side, I would use the back of the blade and get some of this. I should really go away from myself, you know, get that fat off. But this is negligible, what we have here. This is all done for you, and that's what you're paying for. You're paying for that processing. I'm going to take this end. I'm going to cut this. These will make some beautiful uh, steaks 
this here you could actually separate almost, almost with your hands here. That's the chain. Okay, I'll fuss with this later. This, my friends, this is your filet mignon. This is your Chateau Brion. Okay, not these pieces here. Okay, so now what we're going to do. is to pat this dry yeah. this meat has a lot of water and we want to get this relatively dry and then we could take either our kosher salt or our sea salt and I'm going to go with this guy here you're going to season this with the salt thoroughly heavily is the word that I used outside here I'm going to do the ends We're going to put this, as I said, into the refrigerator overnight. You could go two days if you wanted to, but overnight, 8, 12 hours, you're fine. We're going to put this on, excuse me, Donna. Do you put it in the refrigerator covered or uncovered? Uncovered. Uncovered. Okay. Uncovered. Uncovered, you want that air to circulate through, throughout. So, fits on here perfectly, and we'll put that in a refrigerator. Okay, okay so we placed our center cut beef tenderloin as you can see in the refrigerator did a balancing act here but that's fine this is going to go for at least 24 hours and then I'll you know resume okay uh, our other meat is down here I'll start cutting this up when we start putting together the uh, dish okay okay so we left off with these ends a little while ago and uh, first thing we're going to be separating the channel from this piece. We're going to make, make three nice pieces. Uh, we'll make uh, compound some very, very thin steaks. We could do kebabs. So let's say nice sharp knife. Always work with a nice sharp knife. And I'm just going to cut in here. Okay. And I'm going to wrap these up maybe have somebody over for dinner also following up with the uh, Chateau Briand uh, and what I'm going to do if I'm not going to move this meat in a few days you can certainly freeze it so I would vacuum pack it vacuum seal it label it dated and uh, and you're good to go you're good to go for you know a year or two but this prime meat is going to go real fast, mm -hmm. probably in six months, because I have another one that I did. I'm going to uh, wrap this up. Okay, so approximately 24 hours has transpired. We have the center cut uh, beef tenderloin in the refrigerator. And uh, we're going to take a look at that and compare it to the ends that we cut off yesterday so you'll see the difference in color. So I'm going to grab my apron over here.
probably more for show than anything else. I'm not a sloppy cook, am I, Donna? No. Okay, so, open up the fridge. And Donna, you want to just take a peek there? I'm going to be taking this out now. As I said yesterday, we did a balancing act here. Not a big refrigerator. And in a moment, we'll see the difference. Between the meat that we brine, that we salted to create a pellicle, in other words, a thin film all around uh, this beautiful center cut prime tenderloin. So, um, no. let's take this out here. You'll see that there is a difference, considerable difference in color. Okay. All right, so what I'm going to do, because I'm not going to be using all of this, and remember this is prime, it's expensive, and uh, if I'm going to freeze this, which I'm going to do because there's just so much here, uh, maybe I'll keep the, well, whatever. What we're going to do, we're going to look at a piece of equipment over here from Cabela's, it's a vacuum sealer, and it's a very, very important tool. Remember, you're paying a lot of money for the best beef on the planet, your center cut um, filet mignon, your center cut tenderloin, your Chateau Brion, if you will. Okay, so I had sealed, while well, we took a break, um, I had sealed the um, beef tenderloin um, butt end, and what I'm going to do now, I thought it would be a good idea to show you, you know, how this operates, so I'm going to cut about a 10 inch section here, and uh, Don, I'm going to step, I'll come around you, okay, and I'm going to put this uh, let's see what this way, I think. Okay, I'm putting it right on the edge where uh, it seals, on this bar across here. So, just bring this down and snap this closed and hit manual seal. And you'll see the lights going across there. Okay, and you heard the click. It tells me that it's done. It's sealed. I can take this out now, and I'm going to check it. I'm going to check it and make sure it is sealed, which it is. I'm going to <coughs> drop this nice piece of meat. This is one of the ends off of the chain that I explained yesterday. And go back over here. I'm just going to clean this up a little bit. I got a little bit of a mess there. I'm going to put this into the pocket. Okay, we're not sealing it here now. We're putting it in this pocket to suck out the air and you'll see this thing tightened up, tighten up. So you see vacuum and seal. Okay, so I'm going to press this button. When the lights go out, we're not done, you'll hear a hissing sound in a moment. You'll see this, see the juices coming out of here. Okay, you heard that hiss. Okay, we're done. We're done sealing this. And you can see the juices did not, I left enough room so it wouldn't come out here where I messed it up a little bit. Uh, you know. So, 
beef tenderloin uh, chain end 113 20 that's ready for the freezer could take a break here for a second I'm going to drop this down into the freezer uh, before I do that I'm going to save this for um, probably the little steaks for Don and I can cut them out, I can pound them, I could do a kebab as I mentioned yesterday or uh, I can cut up very small pieces and add it to a lentil soup, it will be so tender it will melt in your mouth. Okay, yesterday I had mentioned that it was very difficult to get the uh, veal bones. Uh, joints and you know smaller pieces cut up kind of like the uh, beef neck bones that I have here. Uh, so what I did was well actually Donna shop she picked up the veal shanks veal and uh, veal chops and I cut off uh, the piece and just kept the uh, the shank here with some meat on it. So that's what we're going to be dealing with here. We're going to roast these bones, if you will, for about an hour. And uh, let's just see how we'll go about this, okay? So as I said, we have the neck bones here. And kind of spread this out nicely. Okay, built up that bone, put this guy in here, something like that. Kind of like Lady Macbeth at the sink, always washing my hands here. Try to be as neat as I can so that Donna won't have too much work. <laughs> so now I'm going to take a little bit of olive oil, good olive oil, extra virgin olive oil, put that there. And when I made my brown sauce the last time, I said, uh, next time out I'm going to cut back because I'm not doing I'm not going to be doing, if you're going to do it and uh, you might as well get it done, but um, this is like a 10 inch depth um, stock pot here. I put everything in about a four quart, I think. This is, yeah, four quart. No, yeah, four quart. This is like eight quart. Okay. Let's see what it says then, what we have. I don't think it says it doesn't anything. Say, but it's eight quart. I would say. Okay, close enough. So I just want to show you the comparison. If you're going to do this, you want to, you're going to be spending, you know, 8, 18, 24 hours doing your vegetables. Uh, like I said, I went 8 hours and it's fine. Um, I kept everything to 4, four quarts. So if, we, if you remember, our vegetables... Uh, that we're going to deal with initially are, are going to be celery, onion, and carrot. And I just want you to get a good idea of um, the size chunks that we're doing. But this is the first step here. So I'm going to take some tomato paste and I'm going to, I'm going to cut back on this. So I cut both ends of the can off here, and I think I'm going to live with this. And uh, maybe a little bit more. This is not rocket science. Bakers have to concern themselves with timing more so than cooks generally speaking. Yeah, you think I'd leave that in there, Don? Huh? Maybe. I don't huh? know, maybe. <laughs> okay. 
So what we're going to do now is with the oil, and maybe just give it a little bit of oil, we want to cut a cover both sides of this. So I'm going to really go to town here and cover the neck bones, the beef, and the veal shank bones. And make sure I cover everything with the tomato paste. This is a six ounce can, so maybe I'm using like four ounces, which I think is going to be plenty. You'll see the color of the brown sauce that I had made a little bit later. And um, that's why, so let me, let me just cut back a, a little bit on this tomato paste. will go with that. I'm going to add a little bit more oil to this here. And we're going to place this into a 400 degree Fahrenheit oven. Okay, for about 45 uh, minutes to an hour. So, I could certainly use my timer on this thermometer that we talked about yesterday, but while we're here, uh, let me just cover some of the information. I took quick notes here. This is the uh, Chef Alarm cooking thermometer. It's versatile. So we can place our food in the oven with the, um, with the cable Put this into the meat, which we're going to be doing later. Plug it into the unit, and we'll be able to accurately measure our temperature. We'll have accurate temperature readings. Um, the unit is splash-proof, splatter-proof, has a large digital displays display. Uh, it comes in nine colors. I elected, as I mentioned yesterday, to uh, choose the blue. As Pro Series high and low temperature settings. Uh, you have your probe. And just let me see something here. This probe is plenty long. We're talking about six six and a quarter, six, six and a quarter inches. That's very nice. And we have a cable that's four feet long. So you have plenty, plenty of um, room to move around. Put, put this where you want. Uh, it has... Mm, they have an optional probe too that's immersible. For when you do, Donna, what does Chris Paparo do? Oh, the sous vide. The sous vide. Sous vide. Um, sous vide, yeah. Cooking in water pouches, which we're not going to do here. This has, I believe, three AAA batteries. Two or three, I'm not sure. I didn't, uh, to get into it, I would pop this when I have to replace the battery. So it looks like maybe two. Looks like maybe two batteries in there. Um, what did, where did the pot clip go, Donna? It's in, I think it's in that case. Okay, we have the pot clip here. So the probe can go through here. Let me just note my time. I'm not even, I can do it on a setting. I could do it with my watch. I could do it here. I could do it with here. But what do you say, 1243 by the time. So about... Mm, 
Uh, one o'clock at the... Eh. One thirty. Yeah, one thirty. One forty-three. One seventy-five. Okay, so the probe would go through here. And then clip on to your pot. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, see, I had trouble putting this in this way, so I just realized now I have to pinch this, and then it goes in very easily. So, and you can set this on a, a Dutch oven, a big, big pot. You can set it on a small pot. Um, very, very nice. Well thought out. What else can we talk about? Okay, this unit is, as I said yesterday, I did my research, this is extremely accurate. Um, more so than some of the other ones on the market. And it's calibrated at the factory. But if you want to play around, if it's, you know, off like a half a degree or something, you can go back here where it says Cal, abbreviated. You've got center grade, you've got Fahrenheit temperature, and you can play around with this, which I'm told that you really don't have to do it. It's set at the factory and you're fine, you're good to go. So, let's see. That's about it. It's, it's very simple. Very simple. And like I said, you can lay it down. You can tilt it. If you had a magnetic uh, surface around here, um, you have a magnet magnet here, and it would just go I up to the... I see something in the, in the zip. There... Okay, you have your average temperature. Uh, let's see. Readings here for all kinds of meat. Not too dexterous here. Okay. Minimum dumb, dumb uh, temperatures for food safety, water temp, other foods. So they give you all kinds of instructions. Oh yeah, and I didn't even I didn't even open this up. I didn't even realize nice. this. So. It explains everything. So we'll be looking at this uh, closely later on. Cephalon th by Thermoworks. Yes. Say it again, Donna. The Cephalon by Thermoworks. By Thermoworks. Okay. And we, have, we do have our operating instructions. You have your average temperatures. Now I like to talk about the vegetables a little bit. The vegetables we picked up at Sang Lee Farms. Now, I'm reaching an audience throughout the world, so, but if you are in the uh, eastern Long Island uh, section, Sang Lee Farms has beautiful, beautiful produce. All organic, fresh, organic, local from their farm. So, virtually all the vegetables that we are dealing with here, um, we purchased from Sangley Farms uh, yesterday. And let's see, you'll see what a nice job. Remember yesterday how dirty the kale was? So Donna cleaned these up. The dirt was just filthy throughout. So you got to really it's clean not the this kale, up. It's the leak. The leak. I always, always say, say kale. That. <laughs> That's why you're here, not to be, not to be trusted. Not to be trusted. So you got kale on the brain. Got kale on the brain. <laughs> So, um, I'm not going to get into this yet until I make my bones. Get it? I get uh, it. Okay. I get it. Uh, okay, Donna, focus in on the uh, time over here, 145, which would make that an hour that we had that in there. But actually, I had it in there precisely for 45 minutes, but got busy with other things. So... Donna, you can help pull this out, show them what this looks like. Okay. We'll put this over here. Oven's off. Light's off. Okay. Now we're going to move 
to the meat here, and what I'm going to do is just brush this all over like we <coughs> heavily salted. We are going to coat this with olive oil, the ends too. Bring this back. You see I transferred this into a roasting pan, into that small pan that we had in the refrigerator overnight. We pretty heavily coat this with pepper, just like we heavily coat it the piece with salt, coarse salt. And this pepper mill is coarse, so we're really putting some. You put one, so you put it on the ends as well? Yes, I'm going to put it on the ends in a second here, Donna. Just want to get it all over. Now you can lift this up for me if you can handle the camera in that or not. Can you do that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, let it go down. Bring this up. Okay. Just let this set a little bit. And we're going to talk about our mirepoix and our brown sauce. Now, we are going to, because we would be here, remember the uh, mirepoix slash brown sauce, two steps, is going to take a minimum of eight hours. If you want to go 12, if you want to go 18, if you want to go 24, if you have that kind of time. <clears throat> As I said yesterday, the longer you go with this in a stock pot, the more flavorful, the more powerful this sauce is going to be. But um, I've only done it up to eight. I've only, this is the second time we're doing it, being very candid with you here. Um, and eight hours is really fine. If I had more time, maybe the next time I'll go to 12 and see what happens. But let's come over here, Donna. Um, I cut up some vegetables here. Don't even pay attention to this except for a second. Um, I'm going to be experimenting. I'm going to be doing a demi-glaze with port wine and some regular red wine. Remember I said you don't have to be fancy. You can, uh, we're going to be drinking the Josh later on tonight, Donna and myself. Um, but this is what you want to do. We'll use half port, half tawny port, and half of a um, halfway decent wine. Don't go to the store and get cooking wine. Cook with the wine that you would drink with. Doesn't that, have to be top shelf. But is that again, red wine or white wine? This is red wine. Okay. The tawny port, of course, is red, and you have your red wine here. And I'm going to be fussing around with some mushrooms with the demi-glaze, but that's later on. So, what I chop these, not in chop, what I cut these other vegetables up, other vegetables up with you, don't concern yourself, um, I use a mandolin. Spell mandolin, Donna. Spell mandolin the kind mandolin, of strum. Mandolin the kind of strum, M-A-N-D-O-L-I-N. Correct. 
Now if we add an E to mandolin, we have a mandolin, pronounced the same way, which we, an instrument that we cut up fine. You have different settings here, uh, different thicknesses. But that's for my playing later on. What we're going to look at now is how, what size do we chop up the vegetables? Initially, remember the three that we're talking about? The, um, the onions, the carrots, and the celery, wherever that went to. So I have one over here. This is the size, basically, and I'll get this out of the way so I don't confuse anyone. Don't cut on the mandolin. So, let's see, take off the ugly end here. Let me get over here, down it to the sink and wash this. These are coarsely. This is fine. You don't have to go smaller than this. This is the size that you want. Okay? In terms of the celery. And let's see. What did I do with my onion hunt? It's right here. Oh, okay. Thank you. I slice some of this up on the mandolin with an E, but uh, that's not for this. So chunks like this, this will be, this will be fine. Okay, how much? We're talking about initially. We'll talk about three, about twice the amount of onion that you would. Do. So picture twice the amount here of onion that you would for the celery. And the carrot. What did you do with my carrot, huh? Okay. So we'll take one of these. And I was going to cut like this, but now I'll just cut. Here. These are the chunks that you want. Okay. How much carrot do you need? About the same amount as the celery. Your onion will be twice the amount. Okay. So that's for your mirepoix stock on the way to becoming brown sauce, okay? It'll be a mixture. Let me cut this up a little bit, all right? So we're not going to stand here for eight hours or, you know, I've done this before. So we're going to pretend that we took these ingredients, the initial three ingredients. If you'll come over here, Donna. You'll chop up about the same thickness some of the leek. Leek, not kale. <laughs> not kale, but leek. Even some of the leaves. You can go heavy on the leek. Cut it up about the same. About the same length, if you will, here. Okay? That's all you lots of leek, okay? Uh, use your own discretion. Put some scallion in there. Put some shallot in here. You want to swing the camera around, hon? Put some shallots in here. Put some scallion in there. You can put a little parsley. Generally, I use this parsley to finish, but you can throw a little parsley in there. Um, talked about the carrots. So we'll pretend that we put everything that I'm talking about here into the smaller one, into the, uh, call this the four quart stock pot, okay? And then our bones go in. We would put the bones in here. I don't want to interrupt this because Donna, with the leftover, not kale, leek, she's making a leek, slowly maybe throw in some potato soup, okay, which is just really, really marvelous. So, into our four-quart, smaller version, uh, stock pot, we will put in the bones, okay? So you'll have all your vegetables, you'll have your bones, and then you'll put this on a simmer. And let me just um, explain what I mean by a simmer. 
And remember, we're going to go a minimum of eight hours. You bring this to a simmer, not a boil, until bubbles start to rise. Okay? You don't want it bubbling. You want bubbles to, you know, every few seconds, a couple, a few seconds, bubbles. And you, you watch this. You have to watch this. Go do your thing, set your timer if you're afraid you're going to lose time, be on a phone with someone, whatever, but you want to stir the pot. Now, of course, under a simmer, the water that you put in here is going to cover just up to the level of our ingredients that are on here. You don't want it below it. You don't want it above it. You want it pretty much even. Again, it's not rocket science. Just keep the water level uh, consistent. So under the heat, of course, what's going to happen? The water's going to evaporate. You come over with a cup, cold water. Just pour the cold water in until the water, again, just covers. And go with your initial step of eight hours. If you want to go for broke, go go to your 12 or 18 hours. But, again, we'd be here forever. So what I'd like you to see what happens after just eight hours you pour the stock out which is actually becoming now a brown sauce. Okay, pour it out. And what do you pour through, Donna? Chinois. Okay, so you're going to have a bowl here with your fine mesh china cap, uh, a.k.a. chinois. Chinois. Uh, chinois, pronounced chinois, spelled C-H- I-N-O-I-S. Okay. Chinois. Chinois. Um, whatever you pour out into another saucepan, you'll reduce to almost half. So it's becoming thicker. You're thickening this. And this is the magic. And this is the color of the broth that will come out. And what I've done, and what you will do, is to pour your liquid into ice cube trays for later use. And now, this tremendous job, this lengthy process that you have, you're, you're good for months, you're good for a year. Just make enough for what you feel that you need for six months or a year. Add this to your soups. Add this to the dishes that you're making that require, that call for a brown sauce, and you're good to go. This is the big work, okay? Once it's done, you're set. Now, let's see. Again, where was this? This is what I had to struggle with. My, um, the one that we have on order is about eight or nine inches in length. Eight inch diameter at the top. Eight inch? Diameter across the top. And uh, the length, I, I think it's about, yeah, I think it's eight or nine inches. So that will go into a bowl. Some of them have a stand with it too, mm -hmm. and a stand could fit into a bowl. And it'll give you, it's kind of like a mortar and pestle, if you will. Uh, they give mm -hmm. you the pestle that you would push the liquid out, strain through this fine mesh um, strainer. Okay? And again, into a saucepan. Low flame, reduce it by half, watch it till you put in a spoon and you take it out and that spoon is coated. You've thickened it nicely now. And then pour, put it into ice cube trays. Whatever you think you're going to need. I do two or three at a time. Got two, three, three, okay. And I'm good to go to make some, finish off some beautiful steaks, some beautiful soup, some derivative dishes. Okay, so I'm going to take a break from that now and um, we're going to address finishing off our beautiful 
center cut prime uh, beef, which has been salted overnight in the refrigerator, lightly oiled here with uh, the pepper, and we'll see you in a little bit. Okay, let me show them that I baste, okay. No, I'm basting, so let me show them. Okay, twirl. Okay, so I just basted, just basted our bird. <laughs> just, just basted our Chateaubriand. Just going to add a little more butter to it. Okay. And do you want to tell the folks why you have the other thermometer in there? Yeah, just to uh, check it out. Check it out because this is a new thermometer. See, and, and you there hear it goes. it's going to be perfect, hopefully. So I'm going to close this. Okay. And now we want to bring this up to 130, 125, Donna. So do you want to set that? Okay, I'll set it. Okay, we're back here. Now, remember we didn't really do the vegetables for eight hours. I had done that before and I showed you the cubes and everything. So I had this on a stove after I took the bones out. So we're going to pretend that all the vegetables are in that pot cooking for eight hours. With the bones on top, I made it, may have neglected to say you put the bones in that uh, uh, stock pot, the stock pot also. But then, when eight hours are up, you take the bones out and you've deglazed the pan. You just put this on before. You put those bones in there, okay? Before the bones went in, you deglaze that pan after we cook them for 45 minutes to an hour. And what I'm scraping off here is called fond, F-O-N-D, okay? So everything would go on top of those vegetables after eight hours. All the meat was off the bones. They were just melted off the bones, and that's what you want. I'm going to save this here because I'm not making that eight-hour concoction because I already did that. And we have the brown sauce done, so I'm just going to put this aside. So I think my, I made myself clear, Donna. Okay. Okay. The meat is resting here a bit, but what I want to do now, crank this up to a high heat, and let's see, uh, not yet. Just give this a moment and I'll talk about this. So I made a semi-glaze. When we broke... A demi-glaze. Huh? A demi-glaze. What's that? Semi-glaze. <laughs> Boy, kale and, uh, you know... And leek, yeah, right. And leek and... Um, I took about less than a half a cup of port wine, tw important, 20 port wine, and I took a little less than half a cup of a decent red wine and I put some condiments in here you can make up your own I took part of the vegetables before they were put into the stock and I cut up some mushrooms and I'm going to reduce this by almost half so Donna you wanna maybe I get this here now you wanna hear the sizzle so let's see if we can go yeah. So we're searing now. We're searing. So we're going to do about 
30, 45 seconds. Time we'll call this four sides here. Okay, I had a little bit of olive oil, good olive oil in the pan here. Now, cast iron, cast iron, iron skillet Very is a important. must. Very important. Is a must. Yeah. Cast iron pan is the skillet, the iron skillet. Cast iron is very, very important. It retains the heat, and the and you can see the design in here. Um, it's supposed to make the lines make it nice. I don't know if that's going to happen here. This is your reverse sear process. Rather this than is the searing, reverse searing process. Rather meaning than that, it, yeah, meaning good. that we're not putting this meat in first on a high oven. We're doing the opposite. We're doing low and slow as we covered. Yes, they may say we're making some wine. We're making some wine too. Uh, Don, if you can get me, you know, you're busy with the camera. I'm going to get Tom so that I can do the ends on this. Little I cheated a little bit. I cut off the piece just to make sure we're okay. When we pulled that out, you heard the alarm go off. It was perfect. And See, you got the nice lines here. So this is finishing it off. Uh, this is going, when we take this off, the uh, cast iron skillet, it's going to um, cook for a little while. We'll let it rest. And there's a special reason why we let meat rest. I remember you telling me. Well, you tell them, Donna. Because all the juices in here are like running toward the center, moving toward the center. When we let it rest, it goes back out. It'll go to each end. And I think we're done now. So I'm going to overdo this one. Okay. Let's see. You want to give you a plan? No, you can't get me anything. You have to do the cast. That's why we should have had Enzo here. He's our director. <laughs> but, um, yeah, and I purposely didn't cook this like all the way through because it's just Donna and I tonight because this is the second time we did it. When we have company, we want to, you know, have this uh, perfected, but I think we have it perfected now. We'll certainly see in a moment. Um, so let's go over here. So I'm saying that I didn't cook it all the way through because Don and I will work from the end. So cut off a you know pieces, couple pieces from the ends, a couple here, and then tomorrow I can warm this up or even the next day type of thing. So this is going to be the moment of truth. 
Now, while that's resting, well, didn't, they, didn't they say 10 minutes, five, whatever? I will give it a few minutes, but I want to talk about some knives here. Um, I talked about the importance of very, very sharp knives. And all, virtually all our knives are pretty sharp at this point. But as I'm working, you know, they can uh, dull up. So we sharpen them, or I sharpen them. Um, so just let's see how I can cut that. This is no fooling around. This is very sharp. That's one of business. your special knives. Isn't that a CRKT? It's a CRKT. Home front. Which hunting. stands for... Columbia River Knife and Tool, out of Oregon, I believe. And I have several of their knives, and they're just really, really fantastic. Um, this one here is uh, a bad boy. It's not as lengthy as the other one. It's uh, about an inch shorter. I think this is almost four inches blade length. But this is on ball bearings. This... This thing is on steroids, in other words. And just look, no effort, Donna stepping back. Just so, so easy. And let's look at a knife without the ball bearings, okay? Um, I, if I do it at the same pressure that I did, it's not going to open all the way, right? But if you go like this, it certainly will. So a little flick of the wrist will do it. And they are but, all scary sharp. That was but, the not, that was the seismic that you just did, and the the other well, one. Well, I didn't do this one yet, but anyways, uh, did I? I didn't do the paper cutting with this, did I? I uh, no, you did yeah, not. So, so again, out of the box sharp. Right out yeah. of the box sharp. Well, right out of the box, and I've used the knife a little bit, so yeah. you, you can really. We're talking not sharp, we're talking scary sharp. Scary sharp. <laughs> scary sharp. So this is my what they call my EDC. Donna? EDC. Everyday carry. Everyday carry. I carry that's this. Your, it's got a nice your, clip. That's your Avant, right? Put it in my it's the Avant model. From CRKT. From CRK. All three of them are from uh, CRKT. Um, this one you can take apart completely. It's designed that way. Um, as a matter of fact, you can direct them to our shows where I cover these knives, okay? Mm -hmm. You'll put it up on the screen I then later? Okay. I still want to give this a couple more minutes here, and then we're going to cut in and see what we got. But the thermometer read, you know, I was a little bit nervous, so I just put in the one that we've had in the house forever, and it's like right on the money. But this thing, you heard the alarm, it just signaled us that Perfect. Yeah. this was done. Well, it wasn't done, done. We had about 10 more degrees to go. Well, what finished the 10 degrees off the Fahrenheit the was the um, searing, the searing. The searing of the meat. So... Let those run a few minutes. What else? What else can I bevets about? Um, let's see. Uh, I guess that's about it, huh? Let me take my get, kitchen knife. I'm gonna get your kitchen knife okay. and let's see what's going on my here. My chef's knife here. Moment of truth. Move those two knives out of the way, please. Moment of truth. I think it's rested along enough. You think? Yeah, I think so. You have another few seconds here. All right. Okay. I'm gonna. Where are you gonna cut from? That side. Okay. Here we go. The end piece. Okay. Oh, perfect. Okay, 
This is rare. I was talking about medium rare. Medium rare is supposed to be fantastic as well. But I went on a rare side. Let's see how this guy is here. There we okay. nice. And you can see it you don't have this gray at the end. It's cooked pretty much through from edge to edge. And that's your reverse um, searing process. If you had a convection oven uh, where the air is blown by fans and it circulates uh, completely around, uh, it would be okay to do it the normal, the traditional way. But I love this reverse searing. So Donna, I'm going to cut you off, please. And you have to be your honest self. You'll just tell them you love rare. You I got like it. I like you. Oh, wow, it's like butter. Melts in your mouth. It's delicious. Okay. Delicious. I did a little bit of basting, uh, probably at about 90 degrees, I think we were, when I did the basting yes. on that. Basting um, with what, butter? And a friend of mine, uh, basted when, basting with the butter, and a friend of mine called, uh, called us yesterday and wanted to know what we're up to, and I told him what I'm doing, and I told him about the center cut. The center uh, of this, fla uh, the, uh, which is the filet mignon, it's the Chateaubriand. It is that center of your prime beef tenderloin. You can get choice. Don't even bother with select. Just pay the little bit of extra money over choice. Get your, uh, get your prime. So anyways, we're talking about Julia, Julia T Child. And um, who's the other gal that was with Julia Martha Child? Martha Stewart. Martha Stewart, and uh, it wasn't making sense to me. Uh, she was even kind of like poo-pooing in a nice way, but you don't go against Julia Child and the other fellow. But anyways, um, my friend was telling me he and his wife, they met Martha Stewart, I think it was maybe Colorado at some kind of a convention, cooking thing, whatever, and um, she was doing her thing with Lots of butter. Well, that always, was Julia, that's Julia Child. That's Julia Child. She always talked about yeah. lots of butter. So one of the kids, young adults in the audience, raised his hand. She calls on him. Yes, yes, son. And the fellow says, uh, "Haven't you ever heard of cholesterol?" And she said, "Well, son, let me explain something to you. I am your chef." I am not your cardiologist. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we'll leave on that note. Leave them laughing, laughing. Look at this beautiful, rare meat. And Donna, when we play with this tomorrow or the next day, we'll warm this up. She can cook a little bit more mm -hmm. if people prefer the, uh, the medium. Okay, I'm adding the brown sauce. I melted those. Um, cubes had in the uh, ice cube trays. This is your spaniel sauce. That's going over. We have uh, sprigs of thyme and uh, rosemary. And that's the finished product. Right